Welcome to Wednesday Q&A, where you all ask the questions and we answer them. I'm joined as always by my gorgeous co-host, teacher extraordinaire, physical therapist, lovely friend, Kristen Williams. Fresh off the airplane, we are from- Yes, Costa we are. Rica. We had a magnificent time in really Costa Rica. Did. Yeah. We had a morning mantra of coffee in the morning. In the morning. <laughs> coffee in the morning. I know, we had to say that. So. Anyone who's listening who didn't go on the retreat, never fear. We have more coming up. So you do not want to miss. It's such a transformative week. And okay. um, it, really was. it really was. It really was. All right. Yeah. I'm going to get us started here. So our friend Zila wrote, uh, hi, KB. I have another question for the podcast. A private client of mine struggles to get the arms straight when lifting them overhead. The elbows tend to bend outwards, making kind of a ballerina shape with his arms. I'm not sure how or where this need, he needs to be worked on or to improve this. Any ideas? And so this is this is common, especially in men. And when mm -hmm. she said when she said arm, men, I was like, there yeah. you go. Mm -hmm. A lot of guys uh, are just, um, and I don't know if it's from working out at the gym. You just think guys tend to do that more. Um, it's that you know they're more pushed that way than women uh they just have tight bigger muscles bigger muscle mass so they start to lose range of motion especially in their shoulders and then the tightening in the low back which is going to have ramifications um further down the chain so you know my guess is when her client is lifting those arms up it's a lack of flexion of the shoulder the humerus is unable to get all the way up either because of restriction in the deltoids just because he if he's muscly if he's not muscly it can be restriction in the lats it can be restriction in the low back or even an anteriorly pelvic uh anteriorly tilted pelvis that you know inhibits him we, we even see this with people who have decreased thoracic extension they cannot lift their arms up, so they bend in order to get that sensation of the hands being over the head, but the humerus cannot fully flex up overhead. Um, what other reasons have you seen for that, Laura? Because it's very common. I would say, um, yeah, all the things you said. And it all kind of pulls together. So you just have to think of tissue in multiple directions that needs that needs to be adaptable to different movement patterns. And if you are say sitting at a desk and then you're going to the gym and so you're moving kind of in one direction sagittal plane with probably some postural imbalances. And this is where posture really does show up because if, like you mentioned, if somebody is a little bit tilted forward in their pelvis, anytime you tilt one area, especially the bowl, the pelvis from which the spine comes up, there's gonna be an imbalance of the spinal curves. And so often those people will, when they're lifting their arms because of the tilt of the pelvis and the restriction in the back, the one place they can go into beyond the bowl of the pelvis is the rib cage moving. So the front ribs are not attached to the sternum, which helps with breathing and helps with mechanics, but it also helps as a kind of compensatory strategy for getting the arms up. So if you push your ribs forward, that helps the arms clear. Nonetheless, when you get them up there, but you still have back restriction, that's that elbow bending. So we have, we have fascial lines that come from the lats, as you mentioned, and they come and go across the, the humerus, but then they connect via these fascial um, lines into the triceps. So extending the elbow just feels absolute, like it's like a rubber band that's too taut. So the thing to do is what we do in, in lit is reset the pelvis and then reset the spine and then work on true shoulder flexion because mechanically, and then especially neuro um, motorly, motorically, the, the person you're working with, I, and again, this is so many people, like it's like 50% of our population we probably work with. They have learned to do that so much. They don't even know they're doing it. So I actually posted something on Instagram today. This will come out in a few weeks, but you can look back at it where I use a broomstick behind the back on the scapula. And I did this specifically for a group of men that I was working with who did, just couldn't figure out how to not thrust the ribs. So getting them actually attending to the back 
with the breath, with the front body pulling in and lifting the ribs up. So the ribs really, the entire rib cage needs to lift away from the bowl of the pelvis to get that, the help with the thoracic extension, spinal extension to help with shoulder flexion. It can take a while. And then of course, there's going to be lots of, you know, other muscle groups that are probably underperforming. So these are the people that are truly humbled by very small stabilizing moves, you know, getting in prone and having that person bring the hands behind the head and try and lift up, getting all those great scapula and rotator cuff muscles. It is very humbling for somebody who has that kind of tightness because with that restriction, they've also not been able to fire those muscles. So it's just keep on doing stabilizing work and retraining how to move the shoulder joint without thrusting the ribs. Um, it'll, ha it'll happen with time, but it's uh, again, like everything, it's remapping some movement patterns that um, have led to this. You know, they're still getting stuff off the shelf. It just doesn't look that great. <laughs> and sometimes you can get them, you know, working on it in more of a weighted position, like going from quadruped to down dog, where they can kind of push into something almost as if, I mean, I have people hang from door frames to- Oh, hanging to is great that too. Passive stretch, it feels, you know, just to give them that sensation, but, you know, getting on the hands can, can, can help to, you know, lengthen. And then as a, you know, if you're in person, Zila, you can, you know, give some assistance at the pelvis, giving them a tractioning sensation where they get that feeling of a pull coming over a bolster or a block where you're opening up that thoracic spine, not necessarily encouraging the flare of the ribs, but just encouraging that upper thoracic extension can, you know, can help with that. I'll say one more thing. I, I did work with a private this morning, a male. He didn't have that as uh, exemplified as much as some of the things that would eventually lead to that. But I started off before we even did stuff and just did a little myofascial on his erector spinae because they're super jacked up because the tip of the pelvis forward, it's always putting them on, um, you know, on a shortened position where they're trying to, you know, your body's trying to kind of align. So them being really, really restricted like that also inhibits them from helping you get the spinal extension because you're just kind of trapped by those muscles, erector spinae go up and down the sides of the spine and a little bit of myofascial work and then teaching you know, your person how to do some um, self myofascial work, whether it's with a, a, a roller or something, you know, not aggressive, but just to help get some of that tissue less restricted so that you can work on the mobility. Yeah. It's really common and it's really common to males. Like, like Kristen said at the beginning um, with all these big mover muscles, like your chest muscle and your lats kind of overperforming it can lead to that, those kind of imbalances. Okay. Um, this is from Andra Ka, Andra Ka, how to release the piriformis. They burn after an active day, work, household chores, et cetera. Um, well, you said you gave us a little bit of a hint work and household chores, but I don't know what that work is. So let me assume that it's sitting, <laughs> sitting down. Um, so the piriformis is a relatively small muscle that is an, uh, one of the big six external rotators. It attaches from the sacrum and goes to the, to the ilium in this kind of diagonal pattern and to, to allow that external rotation. And unfortunately it gets a lot of bad press, which sometimes it's deserving, but it doesn't deserve it because it's usually because the other muscles are not supporting, um, or move, supporting the pelvis or moving the hips. So the first thing I would say is it's not that you don't have to release it, but you also have to examine why it is chronically tight because you can do, and I, we've seen this over the years, you can stretch it until the cows come home and it will not change unless you change the reason it is chronically feeling stretched. I mean, tightened. So my guess without seeing you is from the people that I've worked with, um, again, it comes from the pelvis, is your pelvis tilted forward? If your pelvis is tilted anteriorly, that means the front end of the bowl is tipping down and forward. And that puts your glutes actually a little bit on stretch, which means they are not going to be um, ready to fire in the same way. But 
your torso wants some stability and your hips need some mobility. If you don't have the glutes performing, the glutes are hip extenders, they're also external rotators, and they also are stabilizers for the pelvis. So when the pelvis is tipping forward, um, you, you're losing some inherent stability. And so the piriformis will come in both as an external rotator, rotator, but also as a trying to stabilize since it also attaches to the sacrum as does the glute. And they're not, they're just not, it's a small muscle. It's not, it's one of six rotators. So it's, it's not meant to try and stabilize the pelvis. And then it gets, you know, shortened and grumpy. And then more happens after that. I'll let uh, KB talk about what else can happen because of, you know, structures around the piriformis. Yeah. I mean, so you're absolutely right. It is a small muscle that gets a lot of bad press. Um, piriformis syndrome, if you've heard of it, very common in runners and cyclists, um, people who sit all day long. So, you know, absolutely look to see what biomechanically is occurring either while you're sitting, while you're moving. But I find a lot of these people are just really weak in the, the core. And the core is so such a, you know, huge term, but the, the the deep abdominals to help stabilize the pelvis. So it is this, this piriformis is like holding on for dear life, trying to, you know, keep that pelvis as steady as possible. And then it's in this, you know, the, the whole pelvis is in this disadvantaged position. Now I would still recommend while you're doing all of that, there are some great soft tissue things you can do for piriformis too. Um, getting a tennis ball or a lacrosse ball and just putting your that right up against the hip into the wall giving yourself a soft tissue release because sometimes it'll just get locked into that shortened position and it can't let go um, if you can get in there and just encourage that to let go and then follow up with some really good our reset basically <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, get somebody doing bridge bridges, really focusing on that length, that that wrapping under, getting the glutes firing, getting the core, you know, your deep abdominals, your obliques to work, hugging the block. So your adductors are on to kind of fight that you sit all day. And most people sit with either they cross their legs, but a lot of people just kind of let their legs flop out. So they get in this kind of shortened external rotated position, you know, so we start to work those adductors to give that little dynamic stretch of the, the piriformis just to get it to shut off. It needs a reboot of sorts because right now the brain is telling it fire, fire, fire to help stabilize. And it's just not big of a, enough of a muscle. We see the same thing in the neck with the levator scapula. We see it in the low back with the quadratus lumborum. These poor smaller muscles that are called upon because the larger, like you said, glute max not doing its job, uh, the abdominals, your transversus abdominals, your, your obliques, your adductors, these massive muscles in comparison aren't doing the work. And so by getting into the reset, maybe after you've done a nice little soft tissue work on it, you can retrain that brain on how to use those other muscles without the piriformis kind of holding tight. But I love a good soft tissue release. So I would recommend yeah, that. As well. I agree. And then the good old figure four is really nice for, um, Kind of assessing like a nice gentle stretch and just when you're doing it the tendency if you do have a lot of restriction in the piriformis say it's in your right piriformis and you cross your right ankle over your left thigh the tendency is to kind of rock over toward the right because it's it's just pulling that way so keep your pelvis as balanced as possible as you either keep the left foot on the ground or pull the left thigh into you and then keep thinking left thigh over to the left to help balance that out and just go for a nice stretch pull. You don't have to be aggressive about it, but mobilizing the hips prior to doing that, like our, like our reset, stabilizing and getting those abdominals active. Yeah, the transverse, if they're, because again, if your pelvis is pitched forward, your transverse abdominals are kind of stretched and they're not, they're not inspired to, to stabilize in front. They're like a little pelvic band in front. So it's, um, it all again comes back to, you know, looking and examining posture and then the tendencies that come with that. So hope that helps get back to us. All right, we've got another question. This is from Nairi, Yoga with Nairi. Moves for bound hip flexors. So this is another area of restriction. Would you like to start off with that? 
Yeah, sure. And again, we've talked about this several times about are they tight? Are they weak? So I usually with people who feel bound, I recommend both, you know, so always, always, always take a look at, I like to look at how much true hip extension do you have? You know, are you truly bound? And a lot of people actually are, but they're also weak. You see people who they're, they are so restricted in either the iliacus, the psoas or the rectus femoris, particularly in just like certain positions, low lunge, that they cannot extend. So they go into the low back, which, and they tilt the pelvis, especially if you're walking around all day in an anteriorly tilted pelvis, your brain is telling your, those hip flexors that that's normal, that that shortened position. Then you go to yoga or you go and you go for a long walk where you need hip extension and suddenly it just feels terrible. And it might not even feel terrible in your hip flexors. It might feel terrible in your low back. Um, you know, so, you know, what are some things you can do? Um, I like to recommend do some repeated hip extension. I mean, hip flexion, excuse me, you know, knee almost to opposite shoulder. So you're getting that iliopsoas working and then follow it up with a good neutral pelvis stretch just to really see and by stretch i mean you're not sinking into anything but you're exploring your hip extension and focusing on that neutral pelvis and that's going to mean you're going to be firing your glutes how weak are the glute is the glute max you got to think of an agonist and antagonist relationship if one muscle feels weak or tight look at the one on the other side so hamstrings look at quads quads look at hamstrings hip flexors look at glutes adductors look at abductors i would guess in a lot of people who have that tight feeling or or in fact are bound they're really weak in their in their glutes or even down in their calves what's going on down there are they overusing the calves underutilizing the glutes so again we always bring it back to looking not just at the area but looking away and then believe it or not coming up and looking at the position of the rib cage too laura how much do you see how often do you see that people can maybe change their pelvis but then their rib cage does something funny so we really want to find that stack of ribs over pelvis over knee over foot over over ankle ears over shoulders and then you know creating that opening in the front of the hip we do it again coming to the reset coming into sun salutation one to me is all about facilitating that back body to open up the front body what else do you have to say about that I agree with all that. And I would say, um, it's always, it's always kind of oxymoronic, but if you feel tight in your hip flexors, you actually probably need to flex in your hips more, right? To your point, because your hip mobility is probably not, you know, you're not going into the ranges you need to for function. It, you might not be flexing well, you might be tilting the pelvis. So practicing, like Kristen was saying, active hip flexion, doing it in a squat in closed chain, um, really flexing, making sure the ribs aren't popping and the chins out, you know, that hold the apple under the chin move. And then a really lovely uh, stretch that also is very powerful for the core is take a low lunge, say it's your left leg and put your left knee on the wall. So your that front left knee is going into the wall. The right knee is at 90-90. And then see if you can come upright without pulling the knee away from the wall. It is challenging to do that, but you've got feedback because you don't know where you might be kind of spilling or compensating. But if you're pushing that left knee into the wall and then you lift your trunk upright, your right glute better be firing, which it probably will because you have to stabilize the torso. And by doing that, you're also opening up the front of that right hip, but you're also keeping that left hip in a nice flexed position without a tilt. And then you can do all kinds of things. Start rotating the trunk. You rotate the trunk, you're gonna pull at a different angle on the front of those hip flexor tissues. Um, those are some of my favorites and, and boy, are they so effective. And they're, it's small, you know, like, like Kristen said, you don't have to sink the pelvis. That's not effective at opening up the hip flexors. You actually have to stay very active and try and always get this sense of lifting out of the pelvis. So the rib cage lifting up, lifting up and back into the back muscles. It is a sure thing. And I, I love it. It's really, and, and you don't, you know, again, it doesn't have to be a stretch that makes you like hold your breath. 
right? That we're not going for that because that probably means you're kind of going into some passive restraints that are really barking loudly. We want to go into something that feels, oh, that's a big pull. And I need to counter that with more stability in the center and then stay there and breathe. Breathing is key. Breathing is key. All right, we're going to take one more. Um, this is from also Andre Ka. Thoughts about massage guns? You've got one, right? Yeah, we've talked about this a little bit, I think, before. You know, here's my thought there is a lot of help that different modalities can give you that might not have any research backing because we can never ever override the importance of something helping you if you believe it helps. That isn't to say go and buy everything on the market, but I've had people who love massage guns and they say it helps so much. And, you know, if they believe it helps, whether or not it's actually breaking up, you know, any restricted fascia or it's, it's getting like the fascia less compressed. I don't know, the research doesn't support that at this point, seemingly what I've seen, there might be more research. Um, but, you know, I, I say if it feels good and it helps you and you feel like there's like a over, you know, over um, riding effect, then great. Um, it's just like with any modality. If you think that um, putting lotion, you know, putting some kind of magic cream on your hamstring makes you feel better, and it generally makes you feel better, then that's great. There's, there is the, um, it is a very powerful uh, brain body connection that if you feel like you're helping your body, your body might actually sense that. And I think that's powerful in itself. So I'm not gonna give you a straight up answer. I would say definitely try one before you purchase it because, and the other caveat to this is, will you use it? <laughs> you know, it's like, there's so many things we buy that we just, we use for like a month and they sit and gather dust. So I'm always really, I like to be very selective about the products I would buy or recommend with that big stamp. Is this something that you're going to actually use? Is it gonna be a gimmick that you'll use for a month and then put away? Then don't buy one, right? You know, you know the people that have the treadmills and they're like gung ho for three months and then they use it as the like laundry, <laughs> you know, <laughs> airing out their laundry for nine years. So. We don't want that. We want we don't want you to spend your money on something you're not going to use. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, again, I like to look at any type of modality, and that modality includes me as a manual physical therapist. You know, I people will come and they were like, and I will work on them for 30 minutes. Oh, I feel so good when we're done. And it's like, well, guess what? 10%, I'm 10%, 90% is on you. Same thing with these guns with with foam rollers with vibe you know any type of fancy thing that's out there these vibrating heat pad, I mean, all these things that are coming out they are a tool in your toolkit so if you are an ultra runner if you're a marathoner if you're an endurance cyclist something like a theragun might be good for you to you know, loosen up tissues but you got to follow it up with some dynamic stretching some um yoga you know things things that are more brain mapping to encourage length um so i will use my hands on a client to give a release of tissue i do think it feels good so they feel like it helps like you said there's a huge placebo effect um and i do i do believe in soft tissue 100 mm, percent. i do too. In absolutely yeah. but it's got to be followed up with something else so by itself it's, you're going to have to keep using it, but if you use it in conjunction with something, with an exercise, with a, with a movement pattern retraining, uh, it's a great, great option. So, but I'm, I'm with you. Um, I just, like I said, use balls, something small, use my own hands, um, rather than something that's big and mechanical that maybe takes batteries or needs to be charged or blah, blah, blah. I, um, I'm kind of low tech. And I also just don't have enough space in my house to store things. Mm -hmm. um, so I go lower tech first, but the principle is the same. Mm -hmm. So I agree. Um, that's yeah. my take on it. And I'll say nothing like a little deflated tennis ball. That thing can go in so many places and can give you just that nice little release that, um, that these guns are going for as well. So 
anyway, good luck with that. And thank you all for your questions. As always, we love answering them. We would love it if you rated and reviewed this podcast. We love to see what you review and what you have to say or write us with any questions or feedback. You can find me at uh, lara.hyman on Instagram, or you can write support at lityoga.com and KB. You can find me at KB Williams 99 on Instagram or Kristen at lityoga.com. So Kristen with an I. Yep, so Kristen with an I. I. Yes. <laughs> Laura with no you and Kristen. Yes. With an I. Oh, I know. I know. We're really, we're challenging there. Well, thank you as <laughs> always. We really love you all. And as always, we are pulling for you.